tonight I am going to be talking about the actual Chenrezig practice. It's in the, uh, I'm basing this teaching in chapter four of the book Ground Path and Fruition by His Eminence Tai Si Tu Rinpoche. And the uh, Chenrezig practice is commonly done in all four lineages of Tibetan Buddhism and at the KTD monastery, it's done every evening at seven o'clock. And he goes over much of this practice line for line. There's uh, one section at least that is left out and he is brief. Uh, Kenpo Carter Rinpoche has a transcript of a teaching that he gave on Chenrezig that goes into it in more depth. And Bokar Rinpoche has a book titled Chenrezig Lord of Love, which goes into it in more depth also. But this is a good overview of the practice. It's important to understand that Chenrezig, Avalokiteshvara in the Sanskrit, is a fully enlightened Buddha that his realization is no different than that of a Buddha. However, he also manifests as a bodhisattva. So he, uh, the form of him that we visualize is four-armed and he is considered a Sambhogakaya deity. And uh, all Sambhogakaya deities have similar features. They have a uh, protrusion on top of their head. They have elongated ears. They're made out of light when we visualize them and so on and so forth. He represents, you might say, two different uh, aspects. One is a uh, specific being who traveled the path and became a Buddha, became highly realized, realized the nature of everything. And uh, the other aspect of him is that he represents, uh, or you could say is symbolic of the compassion of all Buddhas. He is sometimes referred to as the father of all Buddhas. And this is because you have to have this compassion and the motivation to attain Buddhahood and develop this immense limitless compassion in order to become a Buddha. So he is considered the father of all Buddhas and Tara is considered the mother of all Buddhas because you have to um, realize emptiness before you can become a fully enlightened Buddha. He has many different forms. The one that we are most familiar with and this practice uses is his four-armed manifestation and is white. Uh, as some of you have done here at uh, the Hay River Center, we do a few times a year the practice of a thousand arm chin resi. It's just a different manifestation of four arm chin resi. And uh, there is a red chin resi that uh, Rinpoche taught in three year retreat. And there are other manifestations of uh, Chen Rezi. Tai Sita Rinpoche talks about Quan Yin and he speculates that uh, Quan Yin is uh, the Chinese equivalent of uh, Chen Rezi. Tara arose from Chen Rezi's tears, and so Tara is closely related to and affiliated with the Chen Rezi. And in fact, these two Sambhogakaya deities are the most 
uh, you might say commonly practiced among uh, the Tibetans, the Tibetan lay people, as well as in monasteries. And while it could be understood or misunderstood that, uh, well, Chen Rezi is, uh, he's a bodhisattva and he represents great compassion, but there are other deities that are more powerful and it's better to practice them. And uh, the bottom line is that if you practice Chen Rezi, fully and completely that you will become enlightened. You will become realized that um, don't, what would I say, dismiss Chen Rezi in that way. And if you really do feel very, uh, like you have a very close connection with Chen Rezi, then there's always the thousand arm Nyungne practice that you can do. And this can be done in a group. And as I said, I lead that here at the Hay River Center. And uh, if you are an experienced, a well-trained practitioner who has received the uh, uh, appropriate empowerment, uh, the uh, appropriate reading transmission and the appropriate instructions, then it's fine to do Nyungne retreats by yourself in a retreat type of situation. Rinpoche has had a few students that have done in a retreat situation, a hundred Nyungne in a row. So uh, Chen Rezi is not to be dismissed as being, oh, there are better deities or more powerful deities and so on and so forth. The practice starts with taking refuge and engendering bodhicitta. And the refuge chant is very simple. It's just two lines and it's saying that I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. In fact, I'm going to go here to my copy of the uh, text. Except I grabbed the wrong text. It starts off to the uh, English translation of the two lines are until I reach enlightenment, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Noble Sangha. Uh, so the Buddha, as was described earlier last week, uh, represents an example, a teacher, what is possible to attain. And uh, the Dharma is the path and the teachings and the practices and the Sangha. Here it is the noble Sangha, and that means these bodhisattvas, like uh, Chenrezig, and uh, also the very great teachers, the very great realized teachers like Tai Situ Rinpoche, uh, Gyalwang Karmapa, and so forth. Uh, these are the objects of refuge. Once you attain enlightenment, you have become a Buddha and you no longer need the Dharma and the Sangha because you have attained the ultimate. You cannot go back. And so you take refuge in, you might say, a Buddhahood or your own attainment. And that level of attainment then means that you have cut through duality and you there is no difference between you and uh, all the other Buddhas. The next two lines are about generating bodhicitta. 
and they are through the merit of accomplishing the six perfections. May I achieve awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. And so this is an aspiration bodhicitta that uh, we are doing this practice so that we can lead all sentient beings to enlightenment through accomplishing the merit of the six perfections. And there is a point here that I want to make, and this has to do with the translations. And uh, because he, Taishidra Rinpoche talks about translations and being imperfect, uh, sometimes the translations actually are clearer than the Tibetan, on the other hand. And in this case, uh, there is a, uh, you might say, some clarity here that the translations give you. And what I'm talking about is that the Tibetan says, uh, through the merit of generosity and so forth, May I achieve awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. And uh, the translation is, it, it fleshes out generosity and so forth and uses instead six perfections. And so it is through practicing these six perfections that we accumulate merit and that as a result of that accumulation of merit, it transforms into wisdom and we attain enlightenment. But again, the aspiration is that we are doing this to benefit all sentient beings. If you are practicing to just benefit yourself so that you can attain enlightenment for your own purposes, uh, it will never happen. It's impossible. So it's really important to have this aspiration. And then the other aspect of bodhicitta is what's called uh, in gen uh, engagement. Uh, or, uh, and this means actually doing something to travel the path to be able to lead all sentient beings to enlightenment. And uh, doing the actual practice is that type of bodhicitta. So at the beginning, we start with the aspiration bodhicitta, and then from then on till we uh, dedicate the merit, all of that is uh, engagement bodhicitta. Uh, Tai Situ Rinpoche stresses that uh, bodhicitta, he says bodhicitta is peace. Uh, and on the other hand, he says it's more than being kind or generous, helping the less fortunate, and so forth. Quote, a bodhisattva is a kind and compassionate is kind and compassionate, you know, that they are working to establish all beings as Buddhas. So that working to establish all beings as Buddhas means that they have to, you might say, work with their own confusion first to clarify their own confusion before they can truly benefit other people, other beings because a true bodhisattva can benefit uh, not only humans, but animals and beings in the other realms. He also makes the distinction between uh, having this aspiration and the aspiration to attain nirvana. And uh, attaining nirvana is the uh, motivation of the uh, foundation vehicle of uh, people who take refuge, 
to reduce their own suffering and to free themselves from suffering. The uh, uh, bodhisattva motivation is to see uh, eventually that nirvana and samsara are inseparable because upon attaining Buddhahood, you have cut through duality. And having samsara here and nirvana over there is very dualistic. And when we are actually doing the mantra repetition, there is uh, the visualization and we see we visualize ourselves in the form of Chenrezig purifying the uh, six realms of samsara and they become pure realms and the beings in them become deities. And what this is, is it's cutting through this duality of samsara and nirvana. So the uh, Buddhas, are limitless and therefore our aspiration needs to be limitless also. Limitless freedom and uh, directed towards a limitless number of sentient beings. So then for the next section here, The next section is uh, the developing the visualization. So above yourself in your ordinary form, you uh, visualize a, uh, a lotus, a white lotus, a moon disc on top of that, and then the syllable hri. And the syllable hri will be in the text that you are using to do the chant. And the text that we use, let me see here. Uh, the uh, Hri is in the beginning of the uh, third phrase after refuge in Bodhicitta. And you have the Hri in the... Um, transliteration and the Tibetan Hri is directly above it. And uh, you, uh, the instructions are to visualize the Tibetan Hri. And it might be good to actually get a um, card with that seed syllable on it. You can get them through the KTD bookstore and other places. And uh, if you have that seed syllable in front of you, it makes it easier for you to develop the visualization of that seed syllable. So above your head, not touching, but above, not sitting on your head, but slightly above uh, your head is this white lotus, a white moon disc and a hri. And this is above the head of all sentient beings. This is acknowledging Chenrezig's superiority. And this is a Chenrezig seed syllable. It is not just his seed syllable because other deities will also have Hri for a seed syllable, but it is used here for Chenrezig. And the idea of a seed syllable is uh, like a seed from this syllable then appears Chenrezig. And it, uh, he appears, you might say instantly. Uh, it, in the text, it will give a talk about different aspects of him, but um, instantly he appears from the Hri on top of your head. 
And uh, so he is white in color. He's standing upright. Excuse me, I'm reading my notes here and it's talking about the three. The three is standing upright and it's facing outwards and it's the essence of bodhicitta. And then from that, then Chen Rezi arises. He's uh, brilliantly white in color, stainless. Uh, he, and this is symbolic of the quality of his mind that has never been stained by selfishness, aversion, attachment, and uh, so forth. And uh, he is white in color because his activity is peaceful, pacifying. His face and his body are absolutely stunning, uh, handsome, beautiful, captivating. He has a gentle, constant smile. It's soothing like a mother gazing affectionately at her child. It, the meaning of his name means all seeing. And so he uh, is constantly seeing sentient beings and seeing their suffering. I want to bring up here for a moment uh, a, a picture that I uh, uh, actually I was given a, a book and uh, uh, pictures that were taken from a, uh, a series of caves in India. So you can see this now, can't you? Uh, this is, I'm not sure if I can make this bigger or not. This was on a cave wall that was turned into kind of a shrine room. But this is uh, uh, probably at least 1500 years old and it is Chen Rezi. And uh, it really shows this very gentle, uh, demeanor, head tilted to the side a little bit, looking uh, slightly down, like in meditation. And I really liked that picture when I saw that. I just took that this evening off of the cover of this book museum type of book. But that is... Uh, Chen Rezi. It's not done in a Tibetan style, needless to say. This was probably done before Buddhism came to Tibet, in fact. So the idea is this um, uh, idea of being peaceful, gentle, uh, all seeing, all knowing. He has four uh, arms representing uh, uh, the four immeasurables. Immeasurable love, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable joy, and immeasurable equanimity. You could say he's the embodiment of those four immeasurables. So he has uh, four arms and the first two are holding a jewel in this prayer mudra. And then uh, the other one of them, his left hand holds a lotus like this. And then he, on his right hand, he's holding a mala and the uh, mala indicates the idea that he's constantly um, working nonstop, just like if you were repeating a mantra, how you would be continually turning the beads. So it uh, represents this uh, continuous circle 
of him nonstop um, benefiting beings in various types of activity. The lotus that he's holding in his left hand symbolizes that he uh, uh, can appear in many different forms to beings in different realms. It also has this symbolism that the one that he's sitting on has, and that is a stainless. If you've ever seen a, a actual lotus flower, you will see them as being absolutely beautiful, uh, that pure white, and actually very fragrant. The center of them where the seeds are formed uh, is actually very, very uh, solid. It's almost like wood. And um, I've seen them in floral arrangements that you might get from a florist. And uh, when they come in that form, they've already, uh, the seeds have already been produced and have uh, are missing. But uh, this is, it's actually quite solid. It's not at all fragile like a flower of the lotus. Now, a Sambhogakaya deity has all kinds of ornaments and clothing, and this is standard. Uh, they can take many different forms, but uh, for peaceful deities, which Chenrezig is, and Tara is too, uh, there's going to be a lot of similarities. There are 13 jewel and silk ornaments, and this represents the 13 levels of enlightened mind. I've talked about the 10 Bhumis, and really there are 11 Bhumis. The 11th one is complete Buddhahood, but in Vajrayana, they stretch it out and add two more, and you've got 13 Bhumis or levels of enlightened mind. So that's what the 13 jewel and silk ornaments represent. And the idea of these ornaments, uh, Taisi Rinpoche points out, is that they are enhancing the, uh, the beauty, the grace, the dignity of these deities. So I'm not going to go into them too much now. He doesn't either. Uh, the hair of Chen Rezi is partially tied up to on top of his head into a top knot. And then uh, Amitabha sits on top of that. The rest hangs down loose down his back and it's covered by a silk cloth. He has over one shoulder a deer skin. And again, uh, Rinpoche talks a little bit about uh, people have come to him with misunderstanding about this. And this is about a, a particular deer it is, I might not be pronouncing this quite right, but I pronounce it Tinasara. And it is a legendary deer that was very tender and compassionate and uh, willing to give up its own life to benefit others. So that is the symbolism of this deer skin that he has. It's not that he's a good deer hunter. It is this quality of tenderness and compassion and willing to do almost anything to benefit other beings, including giving up his own life. He sits in Vajra posture with the legs in, full, in what is frequently called in this country, full lotus position. And that represents the indestructibility of his enlightenment and his um, wanting to and accomplishing the benefit of others. Uh, 
his back is resting on another full moon. And this symbolizes that he does not turn his back on others, on their suffering and so forth. And that he is continuously working for the benefit of other beings. Then the chant uh, has a section of praise. We've just finished the section that uh, builds the visualization. And this section of praise is just four short lines. O Lord of whitest form, not clothed by any fault, whose head a perfect Buddha crowns in light, gazing compassionately on all beings. To you, Chen Rezi, I prostrate. And this part is uh, repeated um, three times. And the uh, Amitabha is above his head. That is what is meant by whose head a perfect Buddha crowns in light. Uh, another name uh, for Amitabha is the Buddha of limitless light. So from there then, there's a section here, a seven branch prayer, which he does not mention, but we do that at our center as they do up at KTD. But I'm not gonna talk about that. I am just going to uh, talk about what is in the book. So he then goes to the section where we uh, chant about the six realms and the type of um, karma and the type of emotional um, conflicting emotions that are uh, typical in those different realms and so on and so forth. The first thing of this section is that it uh, uh, it talks about Chen Rezi a little bit more and who he is and why he is capable of helping. Uh, the first is uh, that uh, he is described as being a lama, which means guru or teacher. You could say he is the supreme lama. Next, it says that he is a yidam. And a uh, yidam is a deity, uh, an enlightened deity in this case. Uh, I think all yidams are enlightened deities. There's a, they're just a different aspect of the Buddha in Sambhogakaya form. And a Sambhogakaya, kaya means body. The Sambhogakaya is a body that is made out of light. There's a form and that's what we visualize, but uh, they are made, Sambhogakaya deities, uh, appear in the form of light rather than in terms of material, flesh and blood and so forth. And they are only visible to uh, other beings that have experienced or realized emptiness. And in fact, a sign of accomplishing a particular deity is when that deity appears to you in some Bogakaya form, when you have a vision of that deity and the deity may actually, you might say, give you instructions and so forth. And there are many stories in Tibetan Buddhism about this happening. And um, some of the prayers, uh, this is the source of them.
in the Mahamudra lineage supplication that we do sometimes here. It begins with uh, Vajradhara Dorje Chang. And it is Talopa who practiced uh, and uh, reached such a level of realization that uh, Vajradhara appeared to him and gave him teachings. And he practiced them and uh, passed these instructions on to Naropa, who practiced them and he passed them on to Marpa and then Milarepa, then Gampopa, and finally the Karmapa, and they're known as the Mahamudra instructions. So uh, this is what happens when you practice and actually have, uh, you might say, signs of realization when you experience emptiness and the deity actually appears and gives you instructions. So this is a, a, a yidam. He also is a protector. He is perfect. He protects with his compassion. And he is considered the protector of Tibet by the Tibetans. And finally, he is described as the Lord of love. In fact, the uh, Bokar Rinpoche book on Chenrezy is called Chenrezy, Lord of Love. So we are asking for his blessings for us and for all sentient beings. Then the uh, chant starts going through each of the six realms of samsara and singles out the beings in each of these realms specifically, talking about their what their experience is, why it is suffering, and um, the habitual patterns and tendencies that cause them to have this suffering. And uh, finally, with the aspiration that they be freed of this suffering and are reborn in a pure land. So you could say we are asking Chenrezig's help that these beings may be liberated from uh, their suffering. And uh, frequently it is in these uh, four lines for each of these six realms, it says, may they be reborn in the Potala palace which is Chenrezig's palace in Amitabha's pure land. So we are requesting that they be reborn in uh, uh, Amitabha's pure land and there right next to Chenrezig. To uh, go into these different realms, the first one that is discussed is the hell realm. The cause for rebirth there is anger and aggression. And um, personally, it seems like this is really rampant in the world today, not just in the United States, but that um, there is just so much anger and aggression uh, so many groups out there that are trying to uh, uh, well set off bombs in places where the general public is killed and injured to scare people, to uh, force people to, uh, you might say, follow their uh, commands. And um, so this is the hell realm. It's a realm of 
um, seeing danger everywhere, of feeling like you are a victim of um, uh, you can't trust anybody. And you can have a hell realm while you're living in this world in a human body, but specifically what's being talked about here are beings that have actually died and now have been reborn in this hell realm. And uh, there's a, both a hot hell realm and a cold hell realm. Both are uh, typified by anger and aggression. The hot hell realm, it's hot anger, hot aggression. Uh, and the landscape is seen as being made out of fire, molten lava, and uh, so forth, full of beings that are trying to torture you, kill you, make life miserable for you, and uh, so forth. The uh, cold hell realm is I don't get angry, I get even, and you remain, you might say, calm on the outside. Well, inside you are just burning up and you're waiting for a chance to find a weakness in your enemy and then attack. And so the uh, cold hell realm is described as being like full of ice and very cold temperatures. And uh, the suffering of the cold hell realm is that you freeze, your body cracks, and then of course you become whole again and it go, you go through the whole thing all over again. And of course, there's not a warm place, a safe place to be, to. Uh, warm up and in the hell realm, uh, the hot hell realm, uh, you are um, sometimes uh, just burnt in these rivers of molten lava, uh, boiled in cauldrons and uh, so forth, but they are full of all kinds of suffering. The hung in the mantra Omani Peme Hung uh, represents the compassion of Chen Rezi that purifies the karma of this realm and uh, as a result liberates beings from that realm. And again, the aspiration is, is that they be reborn in a pure realm with Chen Rezi. The next realm is the uh, Preta or the hungry ghost realm. Sometimes the word yidak is used. So uh, this is the problem with Tibetan Buddhism is you get three different languages, uh, Tibetan, Sanskrit, and then English. So the three different words that all mean the same things are yidak, preta, and hungry ghost. And this realm is uh, characterized by greed and miserliness. And interestingly enough, greed can be not just uh, not giving things to other, not being willing to part with things that you have and uh, letting other people use them, but having it and even not even using it for yourself, not needing it yourself but just because you need to have it. And so this is what is called a poverty mentality that you feel you don't have enough. You feel you never will have enough, but you keep uh, wanting to acquire more and more and more. And uh, So the beings in this realm uh, are depicted as having very large bellies and very thin necks. And even if they do find food, they cannot get enough of it into uh, their large bellies to satisfy them because of the size of their necks. Uh, and they see things 
that we would see as edible and see water that we would see as drinkable. They would see uh, a food that we would eat and find delicious as being things like uh, a mucus, pus, and so forth, being uh, revolting. Water becomes like, uh, like blood. In the hell realm, water is seen as molten lava or a river of acid that would eat up your body. These perceptions are important because we think here in the human realm that the way we see water is the proper way, the correct way, the only way possible to see it. But quite honestly, uh, in these different realms, water is seen differently in each realm. And uh, all of this is relative. A Buddha would see water as the way beings in the six realms see it, each uh, realm, and uh, would also see it as it is. So it's important to realize that these yadaks, their perception is confused and not true but our perception is also confused and not true. Uh, the me in the uh, uh, mantra, O Mane Pem Me Hung, the me represents Chen Rezi's compassion that purifies the karma of beings in this realm. Then is the animal realm. And uh, the cause for rebirth as an animal and our karma is closest to the animals. And so we are aware of uh, the animal realm. Uh, Rinpoche talked, by the way, this is Kenpo Carter Rinpoche, talked about, um, he never said he could do this, but he would say that other beings can see beings in these other realms. Maybe not necessarily all the realms, but some in some of the realms. And the Buddha talked about these realms and uh, he could definitely see them. So these are not make-believe, it's not mythology. The animal realm then is the one, as I said, that we are most familiar with because we, uh, many of us have pets or have had pets. And uh, needless to say, um, uh, if you're not a vegetarian, you like to eat the meat of animals. Uh, and we don't like it when a mouse runs through our house and so forth. What is the cause of rebirth in the animal realm is uh, a indulgence in negative actions, apathy, indifference, just not paying attention. Taisitu Rinpoche talks about how animals are um, easily handled by us human beings, right up to the point where they are at the slaughterhouse and are about to die. That even though uh, they are much, much stronger than us, we have no trouble handling them. I have a, uh, uh, an old house and we have these Asian beetles that uh, were introduced to the United States to help control uh, insect pests on soybeans. And there are a lot of soybean fields here and therefore there's a lot of insect pests on the soybeans. And therefore there are a lot of these Asian beetles that were not here until the, maybe the past 20, 30 years. But they have a way of finding 
a way into my house and flying around in the house. And I observe them and uh, they really typify at least insects, if not animals in general. And, uh, and that is that uh, when they get into the house, of course, they're looking for warmth. So they get into the house, but there's no food in here. There's no soybean fields and no soybean um, insects. And uh, they can eat a few other things that are in the house, but inevitably within a few days they die. Uh, and uh, if they would have stayed in the wall and hibernated like uh, their, uh, you might say their cousins, and then gone out the other direction in the spring, they would have lived, maybe not for much longer, but they don't know any better. It's their habitual patterns. And they fly around and uh, their idea of landing is running into something when they're flying and then uh, when they fall, they grab a hold of whatever they fall on. And I think this is a pretty good description of a lot of the ignorance in the uh, animal realm. It doesn't mean that animals can, can't be smarter than that. I have kept domestic animals and I have known animals that other people have kept and uh, there are some, uh, you might say, very smart dogs. Uh, at one time I had pigs here and uh, pigs can be smart and so on and so forth. But the bottom line is that there's still a long ways from being as smart as a, an intelligent human being. So it is uh, this indifference this uh, ignorance, apathy, and so forth, not wanting to, you might say, look beyond. The Tibetan word for an animal means one that goes hunched over. But uh, even, even like a bald eagle that has very good eyesight and is a predator and so forth, they are looking for when they're up flying in the sky, they're looking for a meal. They're not taking out their cell phone and getting selfies to post on Facebook. Not that that's particularly intelligent, but uh, it's a little bit higher level. Uh, the point being that even a smart animal is still not very smart. I have said more than once, you can teach a dog to sit, but you can't teach them to meditate. And that's really the point that uh, I'm trying to make here and Taisita Rinpoche is trying to make also. So there's a lot of suffering in the animal realm too. And uh, A, that uh, uh, if you're a wild animal, you're constantly in uh, danger of being attacked by another animal. Uh, I live out in a rural area, and in the past month, I have seen a lone wolf in the same field two different times, and other people have seen this wolf too. Well, there aren't many animals that uh, don't have to worry about a wolf, wild animals. And... Um, there are a lot of hawks here. There are a lot of bald eagles out here. There are a lot of cats, domestic cats, what are called out here barn cats, which uh, are very different from a house cat. They're not pets. They're kept in the outbuildings and they're fed out there. They never get into the house. You don't ever pick them up and pet them. 
Uh, you feed them because they kill mice and rats, or at least keep them away. And a, a lot of farmers won't even take a barn cat to the vet if it gets sick or injured, because they're barn cats. And uh, of course, animals that are kept for meat, for eggs, and so on and so forth, they are uh, uh, treated very poorly. They're like slaves. So uh, there's a lot of suffering in the, uh, the animal realm. And the pei, omane pei me hung, in the mantra that represents the uh, compassion of Chen Rezi that purifies the uh, karma in the animal realm. And the aspiration is that these animals be reborn in uh, a pure land with Chen Rezi.